I'm Candace Hopkins. I'm the senior curator of the 2022 Toronto Biennial of Art. And together with my co-curators, Katie Lawson and Tyrone Bastian, we have curated What Water Knows, The Land Remembers. This is an exhibition that takes place in nine sites across the city of Toronto and also in Mississauga. And for us as curators, what we're interested in are the sedimented histories that are beneath the layers of the city, of the very ground that lies beneath our feet, as well as the ways in which water forms an archive, something that we can learn from in this place. As you might know, Toronto is host to many what are called lost rivers, as well as ones that are still existing, like Etobicoke Creek and the Don River Valley. And I think for us as curators and artists, water as both an archive, water as an element that always wants to go to the Great Lakes was a source of inspiration. So for this exhibition, we have commissioned 23 new works. We have worked with over 37 artists and participants from all over the world, including right here in Toronto, to make this exhibition. And the Toronto Biennial of Art was founded in 2019 with the first exhibition, The Shoreline Dilemma, and as curators, we consider this as the second chapter of a two-part exhibition that will not only, I think, reveal different understandings of this city, but enable us to look at the city different. This is a 2022 new commission by the artist Tanya Lucan Linklater. Tanya is an Aleutuk artist originally from Kodiak Island in Alaska. And this is an installation that consists of a platform that you can see behind me, as well as a kukumskar sculpture, as the artist calls it. And you may know that kukumskars are worn by various indigenous people across Turtle Island, also in Europe, and increasingly as a sign of solidarity amongst often women. Tanya is trained as a choreographer and she often works with collaborators, including dancers and musicians, over a period of what she calls open rehearsals. So it's almost as though her work is always in formation. I feel that the stage implies performance, but it's also a sculpture. It's inlaid with copper, and the copper, as you may know, is a sign of wealth within Indigenous communities, particularly communities along the Northwest Coast. It's always been a sign of wealth for us, and I think here it shows that wealth is also knowledge. It's not held only in material things. Wealth is in the body, uh, wealth is in song, wealth is in performance as that's passed down over generations. Holdings is an installation by the Toronto artist Nadia Bellaric. And as you can see, it consists of stacks of milky white barrels. The barrels themselves imply how goods were shipped across the ocean, particularly for Nadia's relatives who come from the Azores, an archipelago that's in Portugal. For her, she's transformed them. You can see that they're filled with different goods, with stained glass, with plants, with household items even. And so in a way, they are almost as though they are the shape of memory. Each barrel holds something of significance, not only for the artist, but I think for her family. And they're a reminder of how many immigrants had to ship their goods from the homeland to their new home of Canada. You're looking at an installation of a work by Andrew Carlson. And Andrew Carlson is an Ojibwe artist from the Great Lakes region, and she's particularly interested now in the history of mounds, of mound culture, particularly that of the late, who are called the late woodland culture, who lived between 600 and 900 AD. They made over 14,000 mounds across the Great Lakes region, including one that's very important to the artist. It's called Man Mound. And Man Mound is now known as the only humanoid mound that's still in existence. 
Mounds likely served many functions. They served uh, as a function for, to bury the dead, as a way to place ourselves and our belief systems in this land. And for Andrea, I think it's a way to understand and play credence to non-colonial histories. So the columns function in a way like funerary staffs, including ones that were found in the mound itself of birds. And the drawing behind me called Cast a Shadow is made of many panels that have all been hand drawn by the artist. And at the center of the drawing is a reference to a headstone that was designed by the late artist George Morrison, who was also Ojibwe. And for her, it's an homage as well to his history. This is a sculpture by the artist Jeffrey Gibson. It's called Speak to Me in Your Way So That I Can Hear You. And it's one of the first figures that he started making that were elaborately adorned. You can see that it has jingles and beads and tassels, including the title beaded on the shawl itself. Its head is a ceramic piece that's in reference to Jeffrey's in interest in late Mississippian culture. So these ceramics were found in mounds uh, around the region where his ancestors were born. And there's still speculation as to the function of the heads, which look like they have many mouths. I think to me, what's interesting about the many mouths is it's as though they're speaking or singing. And the sculpture itself implies motion and movement and dance, which is central, of course, to indigenous cultures from around the world, but particularly to powwows, which is a pan-Indian gathering that started in plains out of the grass dance movement and here it becomes a reference, of course, to how indigenous people have always gathered for thousands of years.